ion kinetic energy can be sufficiently fast to overcome the foam barrier. Um, now, if you don't have enough energy to overcome it outright, you can still get through it by tunneling. And um, if you have molecular D2, what you do to unstain close to one another, you can tunnel close together. Now, the chemical, uh, from, from the chemical model, the two deuterium atoms, they overlap form a molecule. There's a, a binding that occurs at the equilibrium position around 0.74 angstroms. As the deuterons get closer and closer together, the ion ion coulomb repulsion dominates the uh, interaction potential. The wave function, you can calculate the wave function associated with the potential looks like this. And the probability is highest when the deuterons are near the equilibrium position, and the probability when the deuterons get very close is much lower. So this tail here is basically the two deuterons tunneling through the column barrier in a molecular deuterium. Um, and from such a calculation, you can calculate the expected uh, fusion rates. Here's from Kunin and Malenberg, Kunin being famous for many things, um, most recently being the uh, head of research at the uh, Department, or Undersecretary in Charge of Research at the Department of Energy. He stepped down from that. For example, the DP reactions for electron mass having its normal value get 10 to the minus 63.5 for reaction rate. So 3 times 10 to the minus 64 seconds is the lifetime of a deuterium molecule when you activate right, from this, this calculation. Very long time, very low tunneling probability, very small reaction uh, probability. So what I want to do is I want to I think about this for this moment. I want to go through some arguments that were Back in um, I can write this reaction rate in terms of, very simply, in terms of the first variable. One is um, basically a tunneling factor. Another is a volume change, namely the molecule that we take. So these two deuterons have a lot of room to be in the molecule, but when they're localized to the nuclear size scale, it's much smaller volume, so you have to make that up as well. And then once you get the deuterons within a few fermions so they can interact, then you have a time constant that tells you how fast they interact. So the way to think about this form is you've got to tunnel through the column barrier to get together. You have to be in the right place also, so there's a volume factor. And once you get together, then you react and you can go out. So it turns out from this uh, calculation, from this model, we can understand these simple multitude numbers relatively simply. We've got a tunneling factor, and the tunneling factor in this case is about 3 times 10 to the minus 7. That's a very, very small number. The change in the volume in the molecular scale and nuclear scale is basically angstrom down to fermions uh, cube. So we get 10 to the minus 15. And if we plug this in and compare it with the, um, with the calculated rate, we get a, a time on the order of 10 to the minus 21 seconds. So the way to interpret that is that the two deuterons in the molecule, they tunnel together. Once they get within fermions, one deuteron gives a nucleon to the other deuteron, and then they push off and they go about as fast as the laws of physics allows them to go. And uh, the 10 to the minus 21 time is characteristic of that. So representative stands in for this very short time it takes for the deuterons to, to leave. Now, that's, that's interesting. It gives us some intuition as to what's going on in the case of the molecule. And the thing that's the most significant about it is that that time is so short that by the time that the reaction happens and the things leave, there's not enough time to communicate with the nearby atoms in the labs. So as a result, you can use this argument to say very powerfully that two deuterons, even if they come together in palladium deuteride from the lattice, once they come together, light can only make it three times 10 to the minus 11 centimeters, which is 300 fermions, which is a very tiny fraction of the distance to the next atom. So there's no way to let the lattice know about it. So if you want to have some kind of crazy scheme to communicate the energy from the reaction,
reaction to lab, and so there's just not enough time to do it once they get close. Soon they react, up they go, and, uh, and the king is, oh, please insert in the report. <laughs> okay, the primary defusion reactions are deuterons, think of deuterons as king, as two nucleons, two nucleons, so two nucleons come together, you've got a three plus one. So here's the one, here's the three. You get two, three plus one channels, kind of roughly 50 50. You get a neutron off when you have the point. Um, here's some experimental results. And the expected line is a little bit less than half the time. It's Oppenheimer and Phillips effect. But on deuteron coming together, if it's oriented to the protons away, then it can get a little bit closer before a cone potential kicks in. If it's oriented the other way, then the cone potential in first to the right. So you'd expect the reaction of the neutron to go in to be more than the proton low energy. And this is the ratio between the two and you get a little bit of an effect. Um, there was discussion back in 1989, 1990 that some kind of amplification of Oppenheimer and Phillips would lead to some kind of modification of the uh, branching ratios, but uh, it doesn't seem very likely. Takeaway message, cone repulsion keeps the Part. Fusion, if you want fusion to happen, you got to be at temperature, you can tunnel. Simplest example is molecule P2. You can analyze it, but tunneling is very weak. The barrier is very large, it's very hard to tunnel through the barrier. Um, and if you did succeed in tunneling through the barrier, you would get conventional DP fusion reactions. And uh, it would be very easy to tell because you would, you would see the uh, So the XSC effect is not consistent in theory. Um, what I want to do is I, I want to begin to orient myself towards events out of physics, nuclear physics. Um, these are two foundational branches of modern physics. And back in 1989, uh, both looked at this experiment and scratched their head and said, there's nothing in this experiment that should allow it to work the way it's done. I mean, condensed matter physics is sort of a simple view of how things work. We've got a born Oppenheimer separation of electronic and nuclear degrees of freedom. The idea is that the electrons go much faster than the nuclei. So you calculate your electrons, assume the nuclei are fixed, and then the order of the nuclei are moving. The electrons structures with hundreds of atoms per unit. 
itself that we both analyze uh, typically these days. So this this is sort of very simple. It's sort of like it's a point type structure. It's uh, like salt. Um, so no mystery. The um, phonon dispersion curve has been studied. It turns out because deuterium is a little bit heavier than the neutron, you can use neutron scattering to uh, measure the phonon modes directly. Palladium deuterite, here they are. <coughs> These are vibrational modes that are physical vibrational modes that are associated with deuterium moving. Um, these are the optical phonon modes. This should be an F rather than an omega. So the peak here is around 5 to 5 and a half terahertz. Up here, this is 8 to 9 terahertz. And uh, in the optical phonon modes, the interpretation is with the deuterons. So are the different directions associated with the FCC in order to make a connection with the uh, different directions listed down here. But the electron bands have been calculated for palladium and palladium hydride. And here they are. Um, they work. There's nothing in the electronic band structure that would suggest that Fleischer bonds are the same that we're seeing. The electron bands, I, I uh, recently was looking, downloading papers to work on a different problem. Something I wasn't familiar with is this uh, angular uh, result of electron spectroscopy that allows you to actually uh, measure experimental data points that are connected with the electron bands. So the electron bands, rather than being a theoretical exercise, Experiment uh, actually respects the electron bands. There's a, there's a new in uh, condensed matter physics you know, from the early days where people were calculating electron bands with potentials. Uh, in this day and age, there's, there are new theories having to do with electrons as quasi particles. There's something called the GW theory, which is probably in this day and age the, uh, the successor to the earlier uh, simple electron bands. So, the conclusion from this, uh, the conclusion is that we can understand from existing condensed matter physics uh, what palladium deuterized is and what it's doing. And there's no reason that you should believe that uh, anything anomalous might happen in it. Uh, in the case of uh, nuclear physics, so simple models, the, uh, this is kinetic energy and potential energy. I'll be talking a little bit later a little bit about how it's going to read and think about them. But the idea is that once you have the empirical uh, potentials that you fitted against experimental data for the nuclear interaction, <coughs> once you plug that in and start grinding it out, you can get good answers. So for example, in 1989, um, available were these um, Empirical potentials that have a very large number of terms of fitting parameters. Um, subsequently, uh, actually before subsequently, here's results from a calculation for the uh, structure, nuclear structure of the triton. So, for example, the experimental binding energy is 8.48 MeV. So here's numbers between 7.02 and 7.67 for different uh, uh, models for the nuclear potential. Um, subsequently, was this new approach. This was um, Steve Seal and Langford proposed you know, a certain kind of nuclear potential might be used to model the nuclear nuclear interactions. And there's this very good nuclear physicist by the Mockerlight who's uh, pursued that. He's called effective chiral field. Um, so in a more modern calculation using these new techniques, so here's the experimental binding energy for the triton. And now here's uh, two uh, two body results from these new models, 7.8. Two body plus three body interactions would be get 8.47. So you're within you're within uh, well, the third digit 
is the one that's um, that's off by one. I mean, uh, from my perspective, this is phenomenal nuclear physics in light of the, uh, this advance is now turning into uh, an amazing, uh, accurate quantitative uh, uh, tool. A n nuclear uh, theory um, has advanced dramatically in terms of the economic and potential, but the basic underlying picture so what's going on is pretty much the same as, as what it was in 1989. Um, so here's one schematic neutrons come together, two, two, comes and um, when they get close, actually, I, I, I have to say, I, having looked at this, I know no longer break it. That's, um, I think I described that you make an excited state for me modern or even calculations in previous years added that it's more of a like a neutron or a proton a stripping reaction. So they come by and you donate one and the other guy gets off. Um, so if you use so this is a little uh, summary of older calculations but if you use the machinery of nuclear physics to calculate the deuteron neutron fusion cross section you can get agreement Experiment. That was true back then, and it's certainly true today. So the argument is that um, the nuclear physics of the four nucleon system is very well understood. We've got nucleon based models of empirical potentials. We can calculate structure, we can calculate reactions. The DD problem is extremely well understood. Um, and once you produce once you have a reaction, the, the particles come off, the energy that you produce come off as energetic nuclear radiation. And uh, that's just not consistent with the flesh and bones experiment. So condensed matter and nuclear physics were mature fields in 1989. They're even more mature uh, today. Uh, Palladium deuteride is a, quote, simple condensed matter problem. Uh, the four nucleon problems, those are reaction is a, quote, simple uh, nuclear physics problem, much more complicated problems we've done in this day and age of nuclear physics. Uh, there doesn't appear to be anything special at all about palladium deuteride that would lead to one would think there should be excess steam. And from this, you could reasonably conclude that the flesh and bones experiment, the excess heat effect of the flesh and bones experiment, is simply impossible uh, based on this stuff. Questions? Well, what's, where's the missing piece? What do we need to be able to explain this? Okay, so let's hypothesize now that maybe it is real. What does that imply for condensed matter nuclear physics? Right. Well, what that means is that something very fundamental is missing in, uh, in our collective understanding of condensed matter and physics and nuclear physics. Something very foundational uh, is missing. And that goes back to Dick Garland's bidding against uh, confirmation. Um, because of this, because so much, uh, something so deep, so fundamental, would have to impact both fields, the likelihood of that, given how old, how mature these fields are, how many very bright uh, people have, have uh, worked in the fields, the possibility that, that you're going to rewrite the fields from the ground up, which is essentially what would be needed to happen. It's, uh, you know, the, the odds are very long. Okay, so you mentioned that you have
sort of works like an accelerator, so your voltage you put on is very close to the ion energy when it hits the surface. And another advantage is you can get very large current densities, current that runs on high current mode. So in those experiments, uh, Wilson has interpreted those experiments as, as being effectively a high flowing beam experiment coming down to 200 electron volts and continues to see um, screening energies consistent with the higher energy beam experiments. Did anyone look at um, what uh, impurities, typical impurities for ladium, uh, ladium butyrate, uh, could have as influence? Oh, there's, there's all kinds of impurities. However, given Given the presence of impurities, the basic conclusions that you would come to um, aren't, aren't impacted in any significant way. Namely, if in fact you don't have a perfect crystal, if you've got a disordered solid, what's present in a disordered solid is going to be much impossible. Nothing. Good questions. Skepticism. Let's talk a little bit about skepticism. Um, so the response to the, to the flesh and pods experiment was a sort of skeptical response, especially among physicists, but the scientific community general, generally. And uh, there were cartoons. So let me, uh, let me emphasize the significance of this. In this country, um, science is supported largely by governmental sources, if you like. It's the public support the science. And if um, in 1989, the um, Fleisch and Pons uh, announcement sort of dominated the discussion of scientific issues in TV, magazines, newspaper, radio, and uh, as a result, some people were concerned that with so much attention going to the Flesh and Ponds experiment, such a, a radical claim with such big implications, um, if it didn't deliver, there would be a sour taste left in the mouths of the public, such that um, continued funding for science generally uh, might be impacted by this one. And so getting Flesh and Ponds off of the radar screen was, was viewed as being um, let me turn to this uh, this impartial discussion of uh, cold fusion by uh, John Isenga. Uh, one of the things that he, to his credit, one of the things that he did was to summarize uh, the theoretical objections uh, from a nuclear physics perspective uh, to excess heat and flash and quantum experiment. And this comes about from this enumeration of three miracles. Um, so at that time, people were suggesting deuterons came together, helium would come out, and heat would be observed. So Isenga, and, and many others at the time, it's not, not only Isenga, many others at the time said, first, you've got to get the deuterons together. From the molecular DP calculation, you know, the time is very small. It's very difficult to get two deuterons together. And once you get Deuterons together, the three plus one reactions should occur. And when we have that speed of light argument that says there's no time to communicate to the rest of the world by how anything else happen. And finally, uh, if helium four is going to come out, well, in normal nuclear physics, helium four comes out when you get a gamma to be added. So if you're going to get helium four, you better get the gamma. But there's no gammas. And so I said, this point, you've got to find some way to hide this gamma. So if you can solve all these problems, then you can get flesh and pawns experiment to be justified um, uh, from a theoretical point of view. Um, from another perspective, or emphasizing this, is this uh, statement from, from John Mannings. Um, cold fusion plus is disreputable to the scientific community as a whole. And this is a claim. And uh, one of the reasons is that uh, very large uh, confrontation between the flesh and pawns experiment and the ones known in the 
transmitted physics and nuclear physics is so large that if you have any respect for these fields at all, you would dismiss cold fusion just immediately. You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't put in any time taking these claims uh, seriously. So here, here's a uh, point of view of Sir John Maddox. So the point of view can be summarized in this, in this graphic. Uh, cold fusion is represented by the lone cell, has been judged by the scientific community, standing in for the scientific community, <laughs> the, assemble, the, the assemblages here, and uh, have been judged, and the sole of the claim has been weighed against a feather found not to uh, Same lecture repeated seven times, or are there seven different lectures? They're, they're different lectures, actually. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to repeat this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, other comments or questions? Well, we're not actually done. We're, we're actually, we've set the stage. We're just going to get started. The way the course was written up, it seemed like your day was going to be the same. And no, I'm going to name any or any one. No, on, on the website, different activities and questions are they repeating. So for example, there there are things which do repeat, but this is a course, so it's different different material that can be. Yeah, I'm curious how many people here are students and why they decided to come to the fusion course. Okay, I would Good scientists tried, they couldn't confirm. There is absolutely nothing in physics, metaphysics, or nuclear physics that would support this. Heisinga's three miracles encapsulate the nuclear argument. The implication is that the experimental result just simply must be wrong. And this is the other option. If the experiments are not wrong, then something is very badly broken at a very fundamental level with condensed matter physics and with nuclear physics. So you know, let me let me uh, look at the other side of the coin. Uh, work has continued and quite a few work has gone on and possible results of one sort or another on different kinds of experiments have been reported at uh, different institutions and a lot of different uh, institutions, including uh, MIT. Um, in 1989, some experiments were done at SRI, um, and a positive result was observed. Uh, for example, excess power, excess power, Shazam, turns on a little bit like what Flash Lapon has observed, although the excess power at SRI in those days certainly didn't get a factor of 20. Goes up, goes up, goes down, and uh, in terms of when it started, in that experiment, nothing special uh, was done to stimulate the, the excess power. It seemed to turn on spontaneously. It was like it happened in mere minutes, right? Was that hours? These are hours, 16, 17, 18 oh. hours. Again, there's a relax, uh, there's a thermal constant associated with the calorimeter, so it, it's happening at least as fast as they're Typical SRI cover near relaxation can be about 40 minutes or an hour or so. Um, uh, Emma, Japan, Emma is a, uh, a Japanese metal company. Uh, so they see excess power. In this case, they're studying excess power as a function of current density. At higher current density, they're seeing something at lower current density. They're not seeing very much. Um, here's Storms was at Los Alamos at that time, so excess power going up and up, and then um, 
binary fail, fail, so the data looks like it's going to fail, and the percent calibration for the points after the, uh, the binary value. Um, SRI put together a flow calorimeter, uh, so water goes in, circulates around, comes out, to measure the flow rate of the water and measure the temperature difference coming in going out. The interesting thing about that is that it's an integral uh, counterimager, so the heat produced in the cell, and sort of all of it gets captured by all of it. Um, in the best SRI, SRI uh, counterimagers, it's something in the neighborhood of uh, close to 99% of the heat was uh, captured by the, uh, by the flow. So with this counterimager, uh, these kinds of counterimagers, something in the neighborhood of 40 excess power events is observed. This is This particular plot, I have to show it, it's from SRI, and I have to show it without the perfect attribution because uh, it's customary. Uh, this is the uh, plot that's probably been shown more than any other plot for excess power. This is a, uh, this line is the current stat profile that was done. This red line is excess heat in a heavy water system, and the blue line is the excess power uh, observed equivalent light water uh, cell that was run um, in series with the uh, heavy water cell. What you can see, a couple of things you can see. First, heavy water seems to be giving an effect. Light water seems not to be giving such an effect. You might look at this and say, well, there's a little bit, but at that time, the light water uh, experiments seem to produce generally no uh, excess power. Um, also, the experiment here seems to be respecting the increase in uh, electrochemical current. And that would be consistent <coughs> with the observations of the Watson and company, <coughs> that if you have higher current density, that <coughs> you get more excess uh, heat. Um, early experiments. Jet energy of the fuser uh, gave excess power. And this is a very complicated graph, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to explain it all. But input to the fuser, <coughs> output to the fuser, control input and output are close to one another. These curves are in integrated energy, and the energy increase on the fuser over uh, the control or the input and output. Energetics, some experiments were done with um, a profile, uh, a current profile for the electrochemistry called super waves. I'd say, well, what's a super wave? Well, here's a super wave with examples of super waves with different kinds. So, the idea, what's the idea behind a super wave? Well, Garvik's got his point of view of super waves related to biological systems cycles and so forth, but another way to think about it is if, if your drawer is stuck and you want to open it, you take it, you try to open it, it doesn't open, so you shake it, and you shake the harder, the faster, in order to get it to go. That's essentially what this, that's my interpretation of what this uh, current profile is doing. And in <coughs> one of the experiments done at Energetics, the famous uh, experiment coil number 64, um, this is essentially the, the best result. The input power is here, the output power is here, and you can see the, the different axes. Here's 0 watts, here's 40 watts. So something in the neighborhood of, um, you know, 30-ish watts at the most was observed. And the input power here, somewhere in the neighborhood, Watt. There's 10 hours. This is zero. This is uh, 10 hours. So it's a very uh, substantial heat burst. But energetics saw something like five events corresponding to an energy gain in the vicinity of 20 to 30. Um, experiment that will appear later on 
that's part of the uh, discussion. That's done by Dennis Sleds. Uh, it's the, the two laser experiment. And basically what it was found, it was found that if you started out the cathode running a little bit below threshold, uh, if, you, if you like, the, if the thing works better at higher current density or higher temperature, then you turn the current density down, you turn the temperature down a little bit so the heat goes away. And then if you come in with two lasers, then the uh, cathode seem to respond to the frequency difference between the two lasers. And here's an example of uh, an excess heat burst. This is one of the better examples of an excess heat burst. So there's no excess heat here. The lasers turn on this red line, and the lasers coming in are seen here to stimulate uh, an excess power response. And the curve goes up. The blue line here is the response of the calorie. And there's an artifact here that's uh, due to a sudden change 